who are going to be the impact freshmen this upcoming season in college football. There's always a couple of them, always a few talented newcomers that make their mark on the season very, very early on in their college career. Who are they going to be? We'll talk about them here in just a matter of moments. Welcome into the Hard Count. Today is March 28th, Thursday, March 28th, 2024, the last one on the face of the planet. Now, you've noticed, if you're watching in real time on YouTube, this was not a live show. This is not a live show. We're recording this, actually, with it airing on Thursday at the time we always air our Thursday show at 11 a.m. Eastern. But currently, myself and Trey Entity are probably around halfway, hopefully over halfway, to Auburn, Alabama to go sit down and talk ball with Coach Hugh Freeze, go see practice out there. We will report back our findings, and we will obviously talk about our experience out there on the plains. Very, very fired up to get out there and excited to show you all that conversation once it's recorded. We're glad to have you all here, man. we got a lot to talk about here. Even with us not being live, we still are going to fill an hour or so long college football show with important topics such as recruiting. we got Josh Newberg, National Recruiting Analyst for, his, for us here at On3, about to join the show here in just a minute and talk about some of the major headlines currently in the world of recruiting because recruiting, man, it never stops. And that's the beautiful thing about the On3 Recruits channel that Josh has a killer show on with the inside scoop, so go check that out. Subscribe over there. We talk Julian Lewis, the latest with him. We talk USC's absolute recruiting heater that we've covered a fair amount on the show. We talk Deion Sanders and his whole approach to not taking in-home visits, talking some movers and shakers from a team level. we got a lot to talk about, so make sure you dial it in there. Also, projection rankings, they are back. Much like Brittany, they are back. I don't know if Brittany Spears is back or not, but... If you know that offense, ref if you know that office reference, uh, we salute you and we love you. Projection rankings for the Big 12. Who are going to be the top five teams in that conference over the course of the next three years? We got a list for you, five through one. Also, never too early. It's back. Georgia, Clemson, Week One in Atlanta. Georgia currently a little less than a two touchdown favorite with that game. So we'll see where that line looks as we get closer to Week One. But we got to break that one down, man, because if you're a college football junkie like us, it's never too early to look ahead to week one and start to break down some matchups, some key points in that game. So we're fired up to have y'all here, man. We are extremely grateful to have y'all a part of this show. Let's get to that conversation with Josh covering all things recruiting as it stands right now early in the 2025 cycle. Back on the hard count, national. Recruiting analyst for On3, Josh Newberg. Josh, we're at the desk, man. It feels yeah. a lot like signing day. Yeah, here we are. It's a good we're going to talk recruiting. feels just like signing day. It's always great to be here on the hard count. Let's do it. Let's ride. What baby. are we talking about? Talk a little recruiting, like you mentioned. Yeah. Recruiting just never stops. I mean, there's like dead periods and there's slower periods, but really it's a year-round thing. Yeah, you know, and I was, I was looking at some of these top guys throughout that top 10 mm -hmm. currently at the time of us recording this and you know airing live uh seven of those top 10 players are committed is this right. a, a sign of the times is that high in your mind like are we seeing more guys commit earlier being a trend in modern college football maybe a little i mean seven out of the top 10 are committed mm -hmm. but 11 of the top 20 are uncommitted sure. so more than half of the top 20 are uncommitted um I don't know if, you know, hey, look, to get to, statistically speaking, we see 600 D commitments a cycle. Wow. How do you get to 600 D commitments? Well, you have to get to 600 commitments you first. Go. So, no, I don't think so. I think, you know, commitments breed D commitments. So we will see these early commits. We'll see a good majority sure. of them stick. Don't get me wrong. A good majority of these early commitments will stick. But we're going to see a lot of decommitments, and this is how you get to a lot. You got to get a lot of early commitments. And, you know, the earlier commitments that, that come, we haven't even started official visit season. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of these committed guys will still take other official visits to the team that they're not committed to. So I think the summer we'll see a lot of change. And then, of course, at the end of fall when coaching uh, carousel begins and all that, that's the next time that we'll see a lot of decommitments. But until – mid to late summer from now till mid to late summer it's just a ramp up of commitments and it's kind of a funny place to be in in modern recruiting because so many times we hear guys commit and then you go okay they're committed but a final decision is still coming so all right so you're you're dating but you're not married is, mm -hmm. is kind of what i'm hearing there from a lot of these guys and one of those guys that's still taking visits julian lewis yeah. i mean one of the top quarterbacks in this class who reclassified from 2026 225. He is a USC Trojan currently, still taking visits. 
Anything you want to add with Julian Lewis? I mean, I, I know there's a lot going on. There's anything you want to make sure that the folks know uh, well, about when it comes to his recruitment? I'm about due on the On3 Recruits channel from time to time. I have my Julian Lewis power rankings. Ooh. And I've had Georgia in the top spot of my Julian Lewis power rankings despite his commitment to USC. Now, one of the reasons why I had I had UGA as the front runner to land Julian Lewis is because Julian Lewis committed to USC in August. Mm. USC did not land another 2025 commitment until this weekend when they flipped Justice Terry from Georgia and, you know, the ball got rolling. They ended up landing four more commitments. But up until this point, Julian Lewis was the last commitment in USC's 2025 class. Now, I do think the momentum matters. I think that the fact that they're starting to uh, surround him with top recruits does matter. I think that they do need that momentum on the recruiting trail to sustain Julian Lewis's co commitment despite all these other teams in the South coming after him. You got Georgia, you got Alabama, you got Auburn, you, you got Colorado, yeah. not that they're in the South, but you understand. There's a lot of teams coming after him, and I think that this big weekend that USC had will do some help to keep him committed. Now, Julian Lewis has already set a spring visit tour. Mm. I DM'd him after that came out and said, are these official or unofficial? He said unofficial. Okay. So that makes me think that he's probably going to visit all these teams again officially. So we're nowhere near the conclusion of this recruitment. And I know a lot of USC fans watch and say, hey, well, he's committed to USC. Why are you talking about it? Because he's taking so many visits. He's taking him to visits in the South, especially because, you know, he's from Carrollton, Georgia, yeah. and he's visiting Georgia. He's visiting Bama, visiting Auburn. We'll see what happens there. But Julian Lewis still does remain committed, and he should be back in L.A., I believe, this weekend or next weekend. So I'm eager to see what Julian Lewis has to say coming out of that visit to see the Trojans. Yeah, great segment from you and Scott Schrader on the Inside mm -hmm. Scoop on the Other Recruits channel. Subscribe and catch all the recruiting coverage all year long. The Inside Scoop dropping weekly, multi -time, multiple times a week. Yeah. Bangers all the time. So check that out. Uh, Julian Lewis, for me, I'm, I'm a big fan of following, like, the gear science, because there's hat science on signing day. I like to track if I'm a quarterback. Hey, what logo's on the towel? I've seen the Georgia towel a few, time, a few times from Julian Lewis. So curious to see how that shakes out, but I'm with you. Having some momentum on the recruiting trail for them to say, hey, if you come to USC, you're going to have some other dudes that you're committing here with. And that's one of the teams that you mentioned a moment ago got active this past weekend. I mean, four commitments, all of them on the defensive side of the ball in the class of 2025. Why is this happening now? Do you, do you have any gauge for why this is now starting to – avalanche for USC at least last weekend it you know, was I think what happened was Lincoln Riley walked into the recruiting office at USC and just turned the lights on <laughs> there it is they must just not have been there it operating is. in the recruiting office until he came in and flipped the switch because sometimes it's hard to find last switch hard to find sometimes in I some mean, buildings at one point on Sunday they land Isaiah Gibson uh right after they land Justice Terry mm -hmm. Isaiah Gibson is one of the top edges in the south uh one of the top prospects in the state of Georgia at one point USC went, so, went from outside the top 50 when Lincoln Riley woke up on Sunday morning, because I'm assuming he, he's an early riser. Mm -hmm. uh, Justice Terry flips his commitment at about, man, this must have been 5 a.m. West Coast time. Mm -hmm. It was about 8 a.m. East Coast time, so very early. Justice Terry flips, then Isaiah Gibson, and with three commitments, they went from outside the top 50 to a top three class, and all three of their first three commitments were from the state of Georgia. Of course, then they go out and they land Gus Cordova out of California, and they land Hilton Stubbs, or, I mean, Gus Cordova out of the state of Texas, sure, sure. and Hilton Stubbs out of the state of Florida. So they're still sitting on five commitments, and all five are from out of state. It's a good, it's a good time to be a Trojan. I'll tell you that right now. Good times, good vibes, and the flip – from the state of Georgia and a Georgia commit, Justice Terry, like that felt sort of like a, a beat your chest kind of commitment oh, it for was. Lincoln Ride. Big yeah. time, big time. And if you're there. a USC fan and you were waiting for recruiting to start, what a weekend to, for recruiting to start. And they kind of retooled that staff defensively with yeah. Eric Henderson. And he brought Aaron Donald on campus. Yeah. It and Eric like Henderson is getting a lot of credit for the success hmm. that USC is having right now on the recruiting trail. We'll see if he can sustain it. Not yeah. only sustain it, but keep these guys committed. Remember, uh, when I saw Justice Terry Flip, it kind of gave me Michael Williams vibes. Michael Williams from a small town in Georgia committed to USC early, but when Penn had to hit paper, he probably looked over at his mom, kind of looked over at his family and thought, wow, I don't have to go 3,000 miles to yeah. accomplish everything I have to accomplish. And my parents and family can come see me almost every weekend. 
I think that's kind of hard. Now, like I said, I think a lot of these commitments will stick. I think USC is going to add a whole lot more. It's a numbers game. They're sure. going to add more elite talent. They're going to lose some. Yeah. It's just the way recruiting goes. It's the, the tie comes in but and comes out. Yeah. they're going to stack it. And uh, USC recruiting, it's on now. Number three class in the country in 2025. Currently, still a long way to go till signing day. To backtrack, Eric Henderson, NFL pedigree, most recently coached with the LA Rams. That's why Aaron Donald was at USC for that whole visit experience, it sounds like. Also, dude, one of the coolest nicknames in recruiting, Coach Henny. Coach Henny. Coach Henny, man. I mean, that's, that's an I'm just saying. That does, that does some... Does some uh, some work for you of itself on the recruiting <laughs> trail, I have to believe, when it comes to uh, USC success. So we talked USC, we talked Julian Lewis. Before we move on to some teams to watch, any players mm -hmm. you're tracking right now, Josh, that you mm -hmm. think of uh, an intriguing recruitment where things stand? I mean, obviously Julian Lewis, yep. uh, but the number one offensive tackle, David Sanders, his recruitment is really heating up. Most people thought it was a Clemson-Georgia battle, mm -hmm. which is fair. He's from North Carolina. Um, Clemson really recruiting well is it, it also, but a visit to Tennessee this weekend. He's going to be on campus in Columbus mm -hmm. to see Ohio State. I believe Tennessee and Ohio State are teams that we need to mention when we talk about the number one offensive tackle in America. Uh, but that is a recruitment that's going to be a, a heated contest. You can be back and forth, you think? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And Should then uh, just one more to watch to Corey and Moore. I know he's committed to LSU, but you're starting to hear rumblings. Maybe Ohio State, maybe Texas. He's from Duncanville High School. Huh. Uh, our number one wide receiver in America committed to LSU. We'll see what happens, see if he makes some spring visits. Recruiting never stops, baby. Got to stay dialed in. Another reason to be subscribed to the On3 Recruits channel. So you're watching this on the On3 YouTube channel, the On3 Recruits channel, recruiting coverage all of the time. So, Josh, that's the players. Any other teams that we're watching right now? Because it, it's hard to say that USC is not a winner of March at this point in time. Still so early on. But any teams that you mm, think could yeah. make a move, looking to make a move before hey, this whole thing is Let's see done. what happens to Georgia. You know, Georgia was yeah. inside the top 10. They lose Justice Terry. They're bounced out to number 11 right now. They got a rebound, and they will. Elijah Griffin, the number one defensive tackle in America, he's in the state of Georgia. He's at Savannah, uh, down in Savannah. And he also took a trip to USC. So it's so I think Georgia, it was a bit of a wake-up call over the weekend for Georgia. Hmm. They lose Justice Terry. Elijah Griffin starts having great things to say. Most people thought he was a lock for Georgia. All of a sudden, he has great things to say about his trip to USC. Uh, see how they bounce back. Then you got LSU just stacking number one players at their position. Yeah. But when you stack number one players at your position, you're going to have a bullet on your chest for the, for the remainder sure. of the cycle. Teams are going to be coming after your commitments. Like we said, Ohio State having a big weekend this weekend. Keep an eye on that. Tennessee, uh, Florida State is kind of gearing up for a run. Miami, we got a big decision coming from the number eight linebacker in America, TJ Alford, this weekend. He's deciding mm. between Miami and Ohio State. Wow. But even if he commits to Ohio State, remember signing day last year? It seemed like Miami was the arch nemesis of Ohio State. The two years in a row – flipping meaningful players from Ohio State late. So TJ Alford's from Vero Beach, Florida, but I think he's going to commit to my uh, Florida, Ohio State mm -hmm. on Saturday. So that's another one to watch down the stretch with Miami and Ohio State. A lot of fun things on the docket, and we're not even to summer yet. And it sounds like Miami, to go back to signing day, they were doing everything in their power, to my understanding, to try and get that Jeremiah yeah. Smith commitment or that national letter of intent to not go to Columbus, yeah. but go to Coral Gables. And this year's Jeremiah Smith is going to be Jamie French, okay. the wide receiver out of Jacksonville, Florida. He had a great multi-day visit to Miami over the weekend, but if you listen to the inside scoop, you know Ohio State is the team to beat for Jamie French. The four-star wide receiver out of Jacksonville who decommitted from Alabama when Nick Saban retired. He's one of the most coveted wide receivers in America, and that's another Miami, Ohio State. Put Florida State in there as well. Maybe put Tennessee in there too. Whew. Boys are buzzing. Yeah. The boys are buzzing yeah. across yeah, the yeah, board, yeah, yeah. man. It's, it's a fun time in recruiting, a fun time to be up on recruiting right now. And this is one more thing I want to get your thoughts on, Josh, before we wrap up here. Deion Sanders not making home visits. To me, I was like – what are we doing? If we're Deion Sanders, we're one of the most charismatic individuals on the face of the planet. Get in front of as many recruits and coaches as possible in person. What were your thoughts when you heard that snippet from Deion Sanders saying, essentially, listen, I'm not going to go in home to these guys. I'm Coach Prime. I can't do that. He's not serious about high school recruiting, and that's hmm. okay, I guess. I mean, we're going to see how the results pan out with, the, with Heavy on the transfer portal. But they finished 66th in high school recruiting last year. Uh, right now they have zero 2025 commitments. And I think in terms of going in home, and I heard what he said about the reasons why, but uh, 
if you know the, the one of the main reasons why these coaches go in home is to learn more about the prospects that you're bringing into your program. You can learn a lot by going to a school. Hey, I've heard plenty of times coaches going into a school, going to look for a kid, and the coach says, oh, he's not here today. He doesn't really show up on hmm. Mondays or hmm. whatever. Well, hmm. if you find that out, and there's just – and there's a lot of good things you can find out of sitting in a family's house and learning about his family and learning these things. And uh, I heard the excuses, but I don't think so. I mean, if you're a top recruit, well, if you're recruiting high school level, you don't just want to land a Jordan seat. Yeah. Georgia doesn't go out and just land a number one player. I mean, look at LSU. They don't go out and land one number one player. They have four number one players at their given position yeah. right now on their commitment list. So if you just think, oh, well, we learned, landed Jordan Seaton last year, that's not stacking talent. I mean, it's a great piece. Don't get me wrong. But they needed like four Jordan Seatons yes. on that offensive line. And you can do some through the portal, but you got to recruit the high school level well. You look at Georgia, you look at Alabama, you look at Ohio State, you look at all these teams that compete year, year in and year out for a, high, for a national championship. They recruit the high school level very hard and they pay, they give it the time, money, and resources that it takes to find the right guys. And I think by, by, by shorting it and not doing in home visits and not going to high schools, you know, recruiting, I view recruiting as a big puzzle. Sure. And I think these things are all pieces to the puzzle. Yeah, it's not everything in recruiting, but I do think these face-to-face -face opportunities to meet the high school coach, to meet, to do all these things are pieces of that puzzle. And look, if you're a top recruit and Kirby Smart comes to your house yep. and Dan Lanning comes to your house and all these coaches are coming in and sitting on your couch, but Dion doesn't. I think that sends a message, even if you don't want it, even if you're not looking for a message, it sends a message. And to me, it just shows that he's not very serious about recruiting at the high school level. And if I'm one of those guys too, not necessarily maybe those head coaches, but anybody that's trying to recruit against Colorado, like it's you in Colorado down to that final two, final it's three, it's like, hey, was Dion at your house for dinner? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I was the rest of my staff and we broke bread with y'all together. Like, I think that matters. And also, I think the, the tough part for Dion too at this point in time is like, Colorado is not at a point where they can say, hey, just just come to us and, you know, that'll be how you find out about us as a program. Like, there's, I think, still very much so in a proving ground. I mean, Colorado. if anybody could do that, Nick Saban in the heyday, four, right. five, six years Kirby ago. Kirby Smart. Yeah. Kirby Smart could have done natties. that after off two natties, could have done the same thing. But they're not doing it because the school's telling them to. I mean, they're doing it because these are this is a part of their process mm -hmm. of recruiting athletes to a school. And also, hey – what if you got a top rated commitment? You know, if if Coach Sanders really put his 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 emphasis on the high school level, you're gonna have all these guys committed to you. Well, other teams are gonna be coming after him. You're just gonna be a sitting duck down the stretch, not going to see these kids when you have the opportunity, when other coaches are trying to come in and flip them. It just you you leave yourself open to a lot of dangers by not doing all that you can in high school recruiting. Also, if you want to flip a kid, like it's much easier, I would have to believe, to flip mm -hmm. a kid at their dinner table than, than trying to call right. him or Zoom him or whatever. Like the face-to-face -face matters. I understand Zoom became a big thing during the pandemic, but I don't think it's the way that you necessarily can stack talent when it comes to the high school ranks and the world that is recruiting. That's Josh Newberg. Follow in uh, the On3 Recruits. Follow him on Twitter, first of all. Also subscribe to the On3 Recruits channel. More the important. Inside Scoop. Bangers all year round. Lock it in over there. Josh, recruiting doesn't stop, and you don't either. You're a machine. Appreciate you, brother. Appreciate you. Who are going to be the impact freshmen for the 2024 college football season? A lot of big names. A lot of big names that you'll probably recognize if you were dialed into the most recent recruiting cycle. And the number one player from that 2024 recruiting cycle is Ohio State wide receiver Jeremiah Smith. Now, he is already enrolled, as is every other recruit we're going to talk about here on this list. And the buzz early out of spring football is that Jeremiah Smith is, in fact, him. He was the fastest player in Buckeye history to lose the black stripe on the helmet. Now, what does that mean? The black stripe being taken off your helmet is essentially a sign from the staff that you are now one of us. You're, 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 a, you're a Buckeye. You're a member of the team. You're doing everything we've asked you to do up to the standard that we've asked of you to do it, and you're doing it at a high level. So there's that part of it, and there's also the reality that you're probably making a whole lot of plays. If you're tuned into those snippets on the Ohio State social media page, it shows Jeremiah Smith making a couple big plays. Denzel Burke is a big-time corner for Ohio State. And he has been known, from, from what I understand, he has been known as one of the most honest individuals on Ohio State's football team. And during bull practice, 
our folks at Letterman Row asked him, like, hey, Denzel, what do you think about Jeremiah Smith, you know, when he gets on campus? What, do you know, what, what are you thinking about him when he gets to Columbus? So, remember, he, he hadn't yet uh, seen a ton of Jeremiah Smith at this point in time. And he said, you know, we'll, we'll see. He's going to have to show me. Jeremiah Smith, again, into four practices at Ohio State, has the approval of Denzel Burke. He said he's impressed. And he believes he can be and maybe will be the next great one, next great wide receiver, that is, in Columbus. The thing I love for Jeremiah Smith and why I think he's going to have a massive impact in 2024 for Ohio State is as good as he is and as talented as he is, as much attention defenses will have to pay him, they're not going to be able to just key on this talented freshman. Because you also got Emeka Ibuka, who's proven he's a thousand-yard wide receiver when he's healthy. They got a stable of backs and Quinshawn Judkins and Travian Henderson and Dallas. Hey, like they got they got some dudes now that can go. So you have that paired with his ability, paired with the fact that you can move him around offensively, you can put him in the slot, can put him out wide, depending on how quickly he gets up to speed with the playbook. Bottom line, the sky's the limit for this kid. He's a state champ in the 110 and 400 meter, uh, 400 meter hurdles in the state of Florida. You're not a state champ in that state unless you're fast, fast. So bottom line, expect Jeremiah Smith to have a major impact this upcoming season in Columbus. Yes, as a true freshman in that wide receiver room for Ohio State. Next up, Colorado offensive tackle Jordan Seaton is going to be an impact freshman. Now they are going to ask him to play right away is my understanding. Like, if you watched the Colorado football game last year, you couldn't help but feel some kind of way for Shadur Sanders because he was running around all the time last year, running for his life, it felt like. Gave up 50 sacks last year to Colorado's offensive line. So you enter in the top offensive tackle from the class of 2024, six foot five, 285 pounds. One of the things I love about Jordan Seaton as he goes to the collegiate level is the fact that he comes from ING. And we've seen this now on different occasions where a player is able to acclimate a little bit more quickly to the college game because they played at a such high level of competition at the high school level, not just in games from IMG schedule, but also during practice. Like, you don't go to IMG unless you can ball. And so that means Jordan Seaton during the week, when he's going through reps during practice, he's playing against college-level athletes. So that's massive. Again, they're going to ask a lot of him right away. Um, I'm excited to see how he translates. Because if he can if he can give Shador Sanders a little bit of time, say what you want about Deion Sanders in Colorado and the process they're going through there as a program. They got some weapons now. Travis Hunter, Amari and Miller. Like, if you give Shador Sanders time to deal the rock, it's going to make you pay. So Jordan Seaton will obviously have a very large hand into how much time Shadour Sanders does have this upcoming season. A team that Colorado's going to play this upcoming season in week two, I believe it is, is Nebraska. And Nebraska quarterback Dylan Riola still has to win the job, but is as high profile a player as recent uh, as Nebraska has landed in recent memory, flipped his commitment very late in the cycle from Georgia to Nebraska. Before that, he was committed to Ohio State. He's probably, I don't think this is a stretch in saying this, the most talented quarterback on Nebraska's roster. Just from an arm talent perspective, the kid can absolutely deal the pill like a shady pharmacist. The good news now, if Dylan Raiola does win the job and is thrust into action early, there's going to be some support for him on this roster. That running game last year, almost 170 yards on the ground a game, bring a lot of that production back. The defense from last year brings back your defensive coordinator and Tony White which was massive, and then a lot of that production on defense that only allowed 18 points a game. Now, the bad news is the offensive line gave up a 10% sack rate in 2023. Y'all, that's not going to cut it. I think the key thing for me with Dylan Raiola to allow this team to make a bowl game is going to be understanding very early on you don't have to be Superman. People see Dylan Raiola, and he wore number 15 his final year of high school at Buford, and people see the awkward arm angles and the stuff that he does. And he gets the Pat Mahomes comp a lot. And Pat Mahomes, very early in his career in the NFL, had to learn just to take what the defense gave him. Hey, it's not bad to throw a check down. It's not bad to throw the football out of bounds and, and have a throwaway kind of play and live to see the next down. Dylan Raiola has to learn that early in his career at Nebraska. And if he does that successfully, Nebraska's going to have a chance for the reasons I just mentioned. Don't need to be Superman. Take what the defense gives you. Because last year, as many close losses as Nebraska had, they had a revolving door at quarterback, and nobody threw more touchdowns than interceptions. Like, there's, there's going to be some pressure on Dylan Raiola to perform as a true freshman, of course, but they're not going to ask him to be an All-American or be an All-Big Ten selection the minute he steps foot on campus. Run the offense. 
Don't turn the ball over. Throw more touchdowns than picks. Should be in good shape. But any way you slice it, he will be an impact freshman this upcoming season. Last guy I want to get to here, wide receiver at Auburn. And honestly, we probably could have done a full segment on true freshman wide receivers that are going to make a major impact because there's a lot of them. Maybe we'll do that in the future. Not an all-encompassing list, but one more receiver I want to get to here, Cam Coleman. He's just different. And that's not just my own estimation. That's the early reports out of spring practice out there on the plains at Auburn. Kids just different. Like you watch them go through individual drills. You look over at the group as they get water and Cam Coleman and his just physical build at six foot three, 188 pounds, just has a different optics to it. The way that he operates, man, he has, according to Charles Power, the largest catch radius of any wide receiver this past cycle in 2024. Now, that's not shade at Jeremiah Smith. That's just talking about Cam Coleman and how special he truly is. To execute Hugh Freeze's offense and to do it at a high level and score at the clip they expect to score at, you need playmakers that can keep that secondary at bay. Because Peyton Thor, man, I think he'll be a little bit better than what we saw last year. I don't think you'll see as many games from him where he throws for less than 100 yards. If they're able to have someone to push that secondary back and then let Guys like Jarquez Hunter eat and let Peyton Thorne get loose with his legs. Like, if you're able to be multiple offensively, this offense is able to operate how they want it to. And a big part of that is having a playmaker on the outside like a Cam Coleman. The big thing for him, his impact will be determined by how quickly he gets up to speed in a college offense. Because we know this now. Typically, when you get to the collegiate ranks as a high school player, as a wide receiver, at the, wide, at, at the high school level when you're a wide receiver, it's like, hey, it's man-to-man. You're faster than everybody. You're bigger than everybody. Go run a fade and score a touchdown. You may have some games like that if you're Cam Coleman. He's still a special player, but there's a lot more that goes into it during the play of, okay, you got this zone coverage. You got to sit it down here. You got to pivot your route here. You got to acclimate your route here. You got press coverage. Like There's a lot of things that go into playing the wide receiver position that you're asked to do, and he will be asked to do at Auburn that you weren't asked to do at the high school level. But even so, man, if he hits the ground running and it clicks for him early, He's got all the physical tools to be extremely dynamic. And him being dynamic, I think the ripple effect of that is Auburn scores over 30 points a game if he's able to be the beast that I think he can be in 2024. And if Auburn's scoring in the range of 30 a game, they're going to win a lot of ball games. Now, how many? We'll obviously talk about that as it gets closer and closer. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if Cam Coleman clicking correlated to Auburn being a 8-9 to nine win football team in 2024 so a lot of big names to know a lot of names to know that we'll probably continue to talk about as we get further and further into the spring season but know those names they're going to be impact guys and uh yeah know those names how's that for an ending to a segment know those names and again that's probably probably not an all-encompassing segment I would not be surprised if we did a volume two of impact freshmen for this upcoming season but regardless some names to know to get us started here in spring football. Also, all early enrollees, as I mentioned at the top of this thing, all early enrollees, so you can kind of keep an eye on some of those practice reports over at Auburn Live, over at Letterman Row, over at Husker Online. So names to know and names to track as we trend here into spring football. Hey, I appreciate everybody that's tuned in right now to the premiere. Now, we're, we're not live on the air. We're actually on a field trip out to Auburn, Alabama, to go visit Hugh Freeze and Cam Coleman and Peyton Thorne and to check out what they got going over there. So if you're watching right now, make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you've liked the video. We appreciate you so much in advance for that as we keep a good thing going. Now, speaking of good things, man, have you checked out how good of a thing week one is going to be for us as college football fans? Have you just, have you previewed all the big time matchups that we got in that first weekend of college football? It's USC USC and LSU, not at LSU. They go play in Las Vegas to those two teams. You got Notre Dame and A&M. You got Georgia and Clemson in Atlanta, which I want to talk about right now. The early line is Georgia minus 12 and a half. We'll see if that line moves at all before we get to week one. But regardless, man, two massive brands and two teams that I think have a Obviously, everything to play for in week one, but there's a lot to unpack here when it comes to the storylines heading into this season for both teams and in this game being played at a neutral site in Atlanta. So before we break it down, make sure you're subscribed. As I mentioned before, it's college football year-round. We want you all a part of it. This is a college football exclusive show. We don't talk college basketball. We don't talk 
I mean, I'm trying to think of other sports. Baseball, we don't talk NBA. Like, this is college football and only college football all year round. So if you are a college football junkie, this is the show for you. This is the channel for you. Make sure you're subscribed. We appreciate you so much for that. For Georgia, man, in this, in this game to start the year, I can't help but feel like this season for Georgia is a bit of a mission. Like last year, I think they probably had the best team in college football. They didn't stay healthy. They didn't win the game. They needed to win in Atlanta to win the SEC and get to the college football playoff. And I think they they understand the opportunity they missed last year. You've heard Tate Rattlish talk about it on his podcast. The offensive lineman for Georgia say like, hey, we probably should have won it last year. Didn't get it done. It is what it is. I think they're, they're a bit of... They're extra motivation for them because they're not coming into this season with the crown on their head of we just won the national championship like they were the last two years. I think they're coming out with something to prove. And I'm excited to see how that translates to the field in week one. Now for Clemson, think about the opportunity that Clemson has in this game. You got a team rolling in here that's won two of the last three national titles. You're playing this game in Atlanta. So there's going to be, I think, a good amount of Clemson fans there. You better believe there's going to be a lot of Georgia Bulldog fans there. They have a chance to make a statement nationally that we are still a player in college football when you look at the national picture. Have things been how we want them to be the last couple of years? No. Have we underachieved based on our fan base's standards and our standards internally if we're Dabo Sweeney? Yeah, absolutely. But even with that being said, you go out and slay the dragon week one and send a message to the entire college football public that we are definitely not going anywhere. Took a couple of steps back last year, but we're here like, the message that they can send to everyone, I think, is absolutely massive, and I'm excited to watch what it looks like and excited to see if they do it in this game. Clemson generating offense, and this one is going to be absolutely massive. It's going to be paramount to the outcome of this game, and that sounds sort of simplistic, but I mean for Clemson from a gameplay standpoint, I'm looking at Cade Klubnik and how much he's able to do. Because last year for Cade Klubnik, you felt like there were times where he was still trying to get up to speed as being a college quarterback, how much is he able to do when it doesn't have the exact right X's and O's line up for Clemson? Personnel-wise for Clemson, they're going to be at a disadvantage. How much extra is Cade Klubnik able to do? Because as good as Georgia is from a roster level, there's a lot of new cats playing in this game for Georgia. They bring back 55% of the production from the last year's team defensively due to the Bulldogs. So Cade Klubnik now, what we know about his game, man, he's got a little bit of wiggle to him. He's a dual threat quarterback. If you don't play assignment sound football, he is going to make you pay. And so how much he's able to do in that department, I think is going to have a massive impact on the early part of this game and the tempo Clemson is able to play at. And I think in a, in a game like this, you got to have a mobile quarterback to win it if you're Clemson. Like you, you need to see Cade Klubnik show off the wheels a little bit. Two guys that I'm watching here on the perimeter for Clemson offensively, Tyler Brown, T.J. Moore. T.J. Moore is a true freshman. I expect him to be an impact guy as well. We'll probably talk about Tyler Brown. I think you saw at different points last year really flash for them. This, to me, is the missing ingredient for Clemson in the last couple of seasons. They have lacked someone to make you pay in the pass game deep. You've had a lot of guys that can go win the jump ball for you, had a lot of big body guys, but someone who can really make you pay if, you, if your safety gets the wrong read on the run game or if your linebackers are worried too much about Cade Klubnik running for a first down on third and six and being able to look downfield and see one of those guys win their matchup, get behind the secondary, and make you pay. That's the thing that has to happen for Clemson in this game. One of those guys or both those guys in a perfect world have to be able to show up in a big way. Now, T.J. Moore, we'll see what his role is when we get closer to the season. But I'm telling you, Tyler Brown, going to be a guy for them this season, has to be a guy for them in this game to get it done. Now, in a perfect world, Clemson will be able to kind of run the football against Georgia's front seven. I think that's a lot better idea on paper than it might be in practice when it comes to actually playing this game. So keep an eye on that. But Cade Klubnik will, uh, will be asked to do more than what's, uh, what's been required of him in the past to win this game for, uh, for, for Clemson against Georgia. Now, for Georgia, a lot of it, I think, is going to start with that pound-the-rock approach. It's going to be all about running the football for them in that backfield. And, and I think Clemson, historically, has been phenomenal on the defensive line. Peter Woods is an absolute stud, so they'll have their work cut out to, for them to, to a degree with that kind of personnel up front. But, like, if you're able to have some success running the football early for Georgia, I'm talking – three yards a pop, four yards a pop. You do a couple of things. First, you control the tempo of the game, and you're able to 
kind of shorten the game, first off. And second of all, you simplify the game plan that Clemson is able to play against you. Because, listen, it's, I mean, if you're Clemson, you got to swing big. And we'll talk about that here in a second defensively. you got to swing big. you got to be aggressive defensively. you got to blitz the safeties, the corners. But if, if we're just getting pounded and pounded and pounded with this run game of Georgia, you just, I mean, you, you got to be honest defensively. you got to put extra in the box. you got to make sure they're committing the right resources to stopping the run. And if you can't do that, and you have to keep on selling out to stop the run, then you set up Carson Beck for some explosive plays downfield. And the early returns out of spring ball for the good folks in Athens, Georgia, is they love what they've got in Colby Young. I think London Humphrey's going to be a dude for you. You know he's got real deal speed, the transfer from, from Vanderbilt. Carson Beck and what he didn't do last year, there wasn't a lot he didn't do last year outside of win the SEC. Statistically, completed over 70% of his passes. He was really efficient with the football, but the Georgia fans, they wanted to see him just kind of unhitch the wagon a little bit, kind of uncork it downfield a little bit more for Carson Beck. And so if that run game gets going, you set up play action, you set up those deep shots that all the folks in Athens want to see. So we'll see what happens there, but it all starts up front for Georgia with pounding the rock, setting the tempo, and softening up that Clemson defense. Now for Clemson, man, I mean, there's, there's no secret here. The line is what it is for a reason. Georgia from a talent level has more dudes than Clemson, and that's not speaking ill of Clemson. I think Georgia just has the best roster in college football right now. And that's why you see them favored the way they are in Vegas right now, to win the national championship. If Clemson's going to win this game, it is absolutely crucial that they are the aggressor, and they're the aggressor early in Atlanta. You don't wade into the water with the great white shark and find a way to win that battle. You don't just tread water and kind of stay afloat and see how things go. Like, you got to go punch that thing in the nose. I'm talking about dialing up Blitzes from that second and third level. I'm talking about trick plays. I'm talking about fake punts. I'm talking about deep shots. Like, you got to put the pressure on Georgia because if you try and play them straight up, even playing field, mano y mano, our guys versus your guys, then you're going to end up falling short. And so Clemson, as good a roster as they have, they just they don't have as good a roster as Georgia, and it's going to take a little bit extra from them. That's why I talk about Cade Klubnik. That's why I think he needs to really make sure he brings the juice with his legs. Going back to that point, the reason why I'm so heavily harping on Cade Klubnik being a dual-threat quarterback in this game is because when you have a dual-threat quarterback, you sort of throw a, uh, a bit of a mystery sauce into this whole game. Because I think Georgia, given what we know about Kirby Smart and how he is involved on the defensive side of the ball and what Glenn Schumann brings and T-Rob, like, they're going to have a really good game plan set up. And so when you have a mobile quarterback, the reality is that can kind of be your answer to a perfect game plan. Like, if we got the perfect blitz dialed up from that third level and we got the look we want and we got a free hitter coming at you and Cade Klubnik just makes that dude miss, well, hey, we got a new we got a new play then. Broken play, schoolyard football. We got our guys ad-libbing. Cade Klubnik's running right, throwing left. Like, he has to have plays like that to get Georgia off balance. Has to happen. Has to happen. But even with that being said, we'll pick this game when it gets here. Obviously, we'll break it down even more. The early lean right now, no surprise here with the line, is towards Georgia. But I'll tell you what, man, a lot can happen, especially in week one. Cade Klubnik, if he takes another leap in this Garrett Riley coached offense, it could be a difference maker, and I cannot wait to watch it. But regardless, right now, early lean towards the dogs. Let me know how y'all feel about that game, man. I'm, it's, it's, just, it's exciting to even talk about week one, to be honest with you. To have that little lower third pop up that you remember from last season with our game preview setup. You got the line, you got the teams. Like, I can't wait for that one. Cannot wait for that one. Should be a lot of fun. And uh, looking forward to talking about it more when it gets here. All right, this is a segment that we had done for the better part of the last month. Did the SEC, did the Big Ten, did the ACC. But there was one more power conference that we did not talk about yet when it came to our projection rankings across the college football landscape. And that was the Big 12. We didn't do that on purpose, just sort of the way it worked out with coaching interviews and how we were shaping up our shows from week to week. But projection rankings, if you're just now joining the show, is not a power rating. It's not a prediction. It is projecting from where we sit right now the top five teams and their respective conferences over the course of the next three years. So there's several factors that we take into account to put this top five together. But for us, we, we 
use the, the following formula, if you will, the following criteria to set this together. The first is your talent acquisition level. That can be recruiting. That can be transfer portal. The transfer portal will be more interesting, I think, for the Big 12 than the high school recruiting level will be long term, just because I think a lot of these schools are going to kind of recruit the same level of guys, if that makes sense. Kind of that, that three-star to high four-star range. Care factor, care factor, care factor is going to be paramount for the future of college football. I'm talking NIL. I'm talking alignment with administration. I'm talking your fan base being bought in. That's massive. Also, leadership and leadership stability. Like, you might have a great coach right now. Is he going to stay? We talk about that with a couple of these schools. But with that being said, we actually have a tie at number five. I could not bring myself to put one of these schools at, at six or put one at, at five all by their, all by their lonesome. Uh, we have Kansas, and I'll tell you who else, are the, who else they're tied with here in just a second. But Kansas, I think, is a top five school going forward in the Big 12 Conference over the course of the next three years. The tough part for me is I love Lance Leipold. The reality is he's just going to be a name that's thrown into every big-time coaching search going forward. Now, he's made it pretty clear he wants to be at Kansas. I respect the absolute heck out of that. And as long as he's at Kansas, they will be a top-five school in the Big 12, if not better. We've seen what they are over the course of him being there. Great culture, find ways to win. They've been actually a really fun brand of football to watch with Jalen Daniels coming back for another year. I think this is just the tip of the iceberg for them. I think they have actually a pretty bought-in fan base that's excited about what they're doing on the football side of things. Kansas, for me, a top-five team right now going forward into the Big 12 with our projection rankings. I'm very curious to see what Lance Leipold does here over the course of the next couple of years as you see big jobs open up and his services be wanted for obvious reasons. Now, tied with them at number five, I got Texas Tech, and I'm a little bit biased here, transparently, because I have uh, had close contact with their head coach when he was at Baylor. I would go to war with Joey McGuire, man. And that's not just me saying that. I was around him for all of 15 minutes as a graduate transfer walk-on, but every single individual in that locker room at Baylor that I spoke with when I was on that team felt the exact same way. There was a lot of people that actually were lobbying for him to be the next head coach once Matt Rule left Baylor for the NFL at that point in time. Like, that's how much he was loved in Waco. Now he's deservingly so a head coach in the Big 12 in a power conference college football. And not just the culture. That's, that's the obvious part. That's the part that I think I can speak to most accurately from a first-person experience. But there is so many things said from other schools and other people in the college football world about how elite Texas Tech is on the eval process side of things and their model, they don't do it like everybody else in college football. A lot of these schools, position coach sees a guy, likes him, brings his film to the staff, they talk about it, they offer the kid. That's very loosely the way that it goes. Texas Tech, they go from a professional model, meaning they have a whole personnel department that evals their kids, and then they go out and offer them. Okay, so what I'm trying to say here is that's how it works at the NFL level. There's a scouting department, they find their guys, they draft the guys, then the position coaches get a hold of them. So for that reason, you see a lot of these guys that end up being four-star, five-star cats, some of their first offers are from Texas Tech. They're, they're on the cutting edge of this whole evaluation and talent acquisition process. I think that matters because what I just said at the top of this thing, you're going to see most of these schools in the Big 12, I believe now, with Texas and Oklahoma out of the conference, a lot of them are going to recruit the same caliber of player. I'm not saying there won't be five stars, but for the most part, it'll be a three-star kid, it'll be a four-star kid. And so why that's important is, or why Texas Tech factors into this, the way they eval and the way they develop and the way they, uh, they, they are on the cutting edge of the recruiting side of things, I think that's going to slowly but surely over the course of time give them the edge, and that edge is going to compound year in and year out. That's going to matter. Don't be surprised if Texas Tech when this whole thing is said and done over the course of the next three, five years, if they have the best roster in the Big 12 by how they eval. Fan base, there's real buy-in there. Fertile recruiting ground in the state of Texas. As long as Zach Kitley is the OC there too, they're going to score a lot of points and be explosive. Now, how long is he there over the course of the next three years? I don't know, but Texas Tech for me, a top five school over the course of the next three years in the Big 12. Go ahead and book that. Now, number four, this is one that's kind of interesting. A new a new member of the Big 12, newish member of the Big 12. 
How about UCF? Because I think they're dangerous, man. I think they got a lot of ingredients now that could make them a player over the course of these next few seasons. The branding they have now in the state of Florida as a power conference school used to be the big three with Florida State, Florida, Miami. You add one more in there with UCF. I think they can kind of tailor that to their own advantage with how they want to brand it. But what we said about Texas Tech is the same thing that's true about UCF. Talent-rich state. You could argue UCF is in the most talent-rich state in the state of Florida. You got a head coach in Gus Malzahn who's been the mountaintop as a coordinator with Auburn. They won a national championship. He knows what it looks like. He knows what it looks like to win at the highest level. He's seen what, ha- what has to happen within a locker room, win at the highest level. And this might be something that gets overlooked, too, with UCF. They have, I believe, the largest student body in the entire country, like, like the largest enrollment in the entire country. Say, okay, that's nice. What does that mean? Well, it means that you then, over the course of the next couple of years, have the largest alumni network. Largest alumni network equals the largest opportunity to create some real capital on the booster side of things and have some funds to acquire top talent with the way NIL is trending. So I love UCF going forward. I love where they sit, and uh, I love Gus Malzahn. So for me, UCF, number four in our Big 12 projection rankings. Now at number three, we got Oklahoma State. Reason for that being death, taxes, Mike Gundy finding a way are the certainties in life. Oklahoma State and Mike Gundy have not missed a bowl game since Mike Gundy first got the job. Y'all, that was like 2005. Just ridiculous. A fan base that is very engaged. You see it whenever you watch teams go and play in Stillwater, Oklahoma and have their conference title race or national title aspirations, whatever it is, like that's where dreams go to die, the Stillwater, Oklahoma. And that fan base and their their home field advantage, I don't think is just something that happens on game day. I think it's year round for them and the buy-in they have within that entire network over there. Mike Gundy has stood the test of time in college football. He's adapted. He's found a way to continue to equip his team to win ballgames. Over the last nine years, they've had five double-digit win seasons. Last year was supposed to be a regression year for Oklahoma State. Played for the conference title. Didn't win it, but found a way to get there. So if I'm betting on something over the course of the next couple of years in the Big 12, it's that Mike Gundy continues to win, continues to evolve, and Oklahoma State stays a power in the Big 12 conference. Number two, I got Kansas State. And for me, it's kind of that, you can have that same logic around Kansas as you do with Kansas State with Chris Kleiman. Like his name is going to be in big time uh, jobs when it comes to the carousel. So I think he's, I think he's staying there. I mean, we'll obviously keep talking about it as we move forward here. No man knows the future. I think Chris Kleiman is pretty set in Kansas State for the future. Kansas State has a fan base that is similar to these other fan bases I mentioned. Dialed in, tremendous engagement. I think they'll continue to be a player when it comes to the conference itself on the talent acquisition side of things. They have won eight games under Chris Kleiman every single year outside of the COVID year. That matters. That's consistency. That is culture. They are a developmental program. They have consistently done more with less under Chris Kleiman going back to his days at North Dakota State. Doesn't matter who they have from a star's perspective. Going to put a game plan together. Going to go out and find a way to get it done. That has been Kansas State football over the course of his entire time there. So I don't think Kansas State's going to change too much going forward. There's a couple teams we talk about as, as cockroach teams. And we say that in a very endearing way. Some of y'all that have tuned into the show for a while now, you've heard me say this. Teams that it doesn't matter who's coming back from the year before. Doesn't matter who's playing quarterback. Doesn't matter who's on the staff. With Chris Kleiman running the show, you know what you're going to get. They're going to be tough to kill. They're going to be gritty. They're going to be physical. They're going to be a team that gives you heck for four quarters. Doesn't matter what your record is or what their record is. They're going to give you all you can handle and then some. That's Kansas State, and that's Chris Kleiman coach football. For that reason, I have number two in our Big 12 projection rankings looking to the future. Now, our number one team, when it comes to the Big 12 and our projection rankings, we go with the largest data set. That is Kyle Whittingham and Utah Utes football. Same thing I just said about Kansas State is true about Utah. The difference for me is Kyle Whittingham has been doing it for a very, very long time. When I was in high school, my very first letter I got was from Utah. Think about that. I went to high school and and graduated in 2015. 
Kyle Whittingham was the head coach there. He's still the head coach now. He has built a culture and a brand there at Utah with how they play on the field that is second to none. They do not beat themselves. They have tremendous player leadership year in and year out that is fostered by Kyle Whittingham. That's going to stand the test of time. Same thing about Kansas State is true about Utah. Developmental program. Doesn't matter how many stars you have. They're going to do just fine with their three-star guys. And the way this conference is trending, I think that's going to make a a very, very big impact on, on them going forward and the way they're going to trend here in this new Big 12 conference. So to recap it for you, tied at five, Kansas and Texas Tech. Kansas with Lance Leipold. I think they're going to be a top five team with him in this conference for the, for the foreseeable future. Texas Tech, eval process, rock solid culture in Joey McGuire. Would not be surprised in the slightest if Texas Tech won the conference in the next three years. UCF, hotbed around them in the state of Florida. A head coach knows what's going on there when it comes to knowing how to win. And Gus Miles on in his time in college football. Massive, massive student body, massive alumni network could make for massive opportunity in the NIL landscape, which is, of course, where college football is heading. At number three, you got Oklahoma State. Death taxes Mike Gundy finding a way, baby. No way around it. Kansas State, cockroach team with Chris Kleiman. We mean that in the most, I mean, admiration, admirable. What's the right word? We mean that in a positive way when it comes to Chris Kleiman in Kansas State and then Utah. I mean, the, the data set speaks for itself with Kyle Whittingham and how successful he's been out there for the Utes. So a lot of people are going to see this and say, hey, no Colorado? J.D., Deion Sanders and the way that he's built for modern college football, no Colorado? I hear what you're saying, and I understand where you're coming from, but I would push back on that a good bit, and we'll talk more about Colorado here in the future. But like, when it comes to Deion Sanders in Colorado, we're talking about the next three years. I'm not even sure Deion Sanders is going to be there in the next three years. And that's not me telling you that Colorado is going to fire him or anything like that, or he won't succeed. Deion Sanders, over the course of his career, very obviously, has been linked to where his sons have been playing football at the high school level. I believe he was their head coach, for Shadour at least. Goes to Jackson State. Shadour Sanders then goes in and commits to Jackson State. I believe he flipped from FAU. Shadour Sanders and Deion Sanders go to Colorado together. Like, what happens when Shadour Sanders goes to the league? What happens when Travis Hunter goes to the league? I'm not implying that Deion Sanders goes to the NFL, but I am saying I haven't seen a, a Deion Sanders football team without his son playing quarterback in some time. That's not me throwing shade at Deion. That's me telling you I don't know where Colorado and Deion Sanders, if they're going to be together in three years. Okay, the other part of this, I mean, I, I've been pretty transparent about this. I love Deion Sanders and the way that he leads men. But at the same time, I have some very real question marks about the way that he operates on the recruiting trail. And it's not me just saying that. Like, I understand you landed Jordan Seaton, and that's phenomenal. I think he'll be an impact freshman for you. But the fact that he's not making home visits is a very, very serious red flag to me. And, and I mean, the, the results show it. I mean, they, I believe they signed less than double-digit guys in the 2024 cycle. Now, I get it. You want to lean on the portal, and I understand they've been successful in doing that over the course of the last year. They overhauled the roster and, and had some success there. Like, I just think the data size is too small for the time being. And going forward, I have question marks about his future with Colorado once Shadour Sanders and Travis Hunter and Shiloh Sanders all leave. It's not me throwing shade, just question marks I have. I'd love for him to stay at Colorado. I'd love that for college football. There's no way around it. He has been tremendous for college football, the way he has elevated that program, the way that he has brought juice to the sport as a whole. I love it. But for right now, I'm going to wait and see a little bit before I put them in the top five. So there you have it. We appreciate y'all that we're dialed in pseudo live to this show. Again, we're not live in, in living color right now, but cannot wait to get back in the studio on Tuesday and talk about our conversation with Hugh Freeze. More than likely show you that conversation with Hugh Freeze, talk about Auburn and the direction they're headed in 2024. Still just absolutely ridiculous. We get to do this and call it a job and earn a paycheck for it. Thank you for making that possible. Thank you for being a part of this college football community. It's something we will never, ever take for granted. We have the best job in the world, and we appreciate y'all contributing to that. So we love y'all. We appreciate y'all. Subscribe on the way out of here. Make sure you're following on the socials at JD Pakel, Twitter, Instagram, to get some more behind-the-scenes content for our trip at Auburn and some other places potentially during the spring period. We love y'all. We appreciate y'all. Going to keep this party rolling, and we will see y'all next time.